We keep hearing from the media about our failing public schools. Well, the Phoenix Union High School District has a different story to tell. Four years ago, Carl Hayden was a D school, and they were just a few points from being in F school. Last year, Carl Hayden was 10 points from being in A school. Two years ago, 10% of our sophomores taking the A reading test tested in the far, far below. Last year, 1%. Obviously, Dr. Scribner, Dr. Allen, Dr. Kayes, and Murray have done a great job. Does that mean it's time for the Phoenix Union High School District to coast? No. One of my favorite sayings is to ride a bicycle. You, to maintain poise and balance, you have to keep moving forward. So tonight is all about moving forward. May 27th, 2005. I'm George Stephanopoulos, and this is Nightline. Tonight, these kids were out of their league. I don't think they took us seriously in the beginning. They didn't think we knew what we were talking about. High school students pitted against one of the best universities in the country. These kids uh, come in, and, and your assumption is, when you see them, that uh, they've got everything against them, and uh, you're kind of worried about them. When MIT was announced as a second place winner, we were all deathly silent. A David and Goliath story with a twist. Sometimes I feel like I'm not wanted here. It's just one more roadblock. You're optimistic. I'm optimistic. Tonight, Stinky, the little robot that could. In Hollywood, the pitch could go something like this. Goodwill Hunting meets Stand and Deliver with a little bit of Hoosiers thrown in. Four gritty kids from the wrong side of the tracks hook up with two inspired teachers and hook together a robot to rival R2-D2. They all head for a stunning finish in a competition they literally have no business even being in. You wouldn't believe it if you saw it at the movies, but every bit is true. And aside from a big thank you to Wired Magazine for bringing us tonight's story, that's all I'm going to say. You just have to see it. Here's Judy Muller. Underwater robots are not exactly common in the arid state of Arizona. But then this robot, nicknamed Stinky, was built by a most uncommon group of teenagers. They weren't expecting that we would be uh, doing all this because we're at, like, in the middle of the desert. <laughs> There's not very many lakes that you can actually dive into around here. So underwater robots not big in Phoenix? Nah. <laughs> Luis Saranda, Oscar Vasquez, Lorenzo Santillan, and Christian Arcega may be from the mean streets of West Phoenix, but they manage to surprise everyone, even themselves. The real fight is within the kids. They are very comfortable with staying below the radar because everyone else does it, and it is expected of them. But once they've tasted what they can do, I think that falls by the wayside. This is a tough neighborhood. Poverty grinds people down and lowers expectations. Many high school students don't even consider going to college. For most, English is a second language. 92% of the students at Carl Hayden High School are Hispanic, living in a neighborhood where the average per capita income is $9,000. 87% of these students qualify for the free lunch program. And two-thirds of the adults who live in this school district have no high school diploma. And yet this school boasts a graduation rate of 70%. I wanted to have after-school time with kids to show them that math and science and engineering are things that can be extremely useful, fun, and exciting, and it's not just what you see in a textbook in a 50-minute class period. I wanted to get involved with kids uh, after school and start these larger-than-life projects, things where everyone had to depend on each other, everyone was responsible for doing one part of the project, uh, things that also kind of drew some media attention.
Because one of the things I've noticed early on too is that the kids aren't used to getting attention for something good. They're usually getting attention for something bad. And so when they felt the good version, it motivated them even more to want to do more of these type of things. Anybody who walks through the door and says, I want to be on the team is on our team. We don't have any qualification process or anything like that. Um, and the idea is, is we value the diversity. We want every kind of group of people involved, whether they're high academic achievers, low academic achievers, any ethnic diversity, any gender, anything, because we value everybody's input. Because you don't know where that next idea is going to come from. And if you exclude people, you could be excluding part of your success. We wanted to enter the university category because um, we thought we're, we're going to lose whether we go in the underwater high school division or university. So we'd be more impressive losing in the bigger competition. <laughs> so the other thing that happened, which is interesting, and it shows you kind of where we were, we printed a list of all the teams in the competition, and there's all these universities, and then there's Carl Hayden High School. And we stuck it on the hallway outside the classroom, so people going by would go, oh look, you're competing against all these schools. And Lorenzo, one of the kids, is looking at the list, and he says, well, what's MIT? <laughs> and I said, well, uh, that's the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, probably, you know, it's one of the best schools in the country, if not in the world. And he turned around to me and he goes, well, if we beat MIT, can, can you take me to Hooters? <laughs> and, and I thought, and that's an interesting motivational approach. Uh, and I thought I was completely safe in making that bet. Sorry if anyone, uh, if my administrators thought that was inappropriate. But I thought, there's no chance in hell this guy's going to ever get this. So, sure, I'll take you to Hooters if we beat him my team. underwater portion where the robots were performing in the water, we were third underwater. And I was in heaven. I was thinking, wow, this is absolutely fantastic. Who would have thought we'd be in this position, right? We, I wasn't even thinking, and I'm sure nobody else was thinking, wow, if we can just get the other part of the competition down, we might get a better place. Because, I mean, you are going against MIT in an oral presentation and a written presentation. So the idea of actually improving our place seemed like no possibility. We were just wondering how far we were going to fall down. So in the award ceremony, they gave an award called the Judges Award. And it's one of the first ones. And they announced our name. And we had to you know, kind of encourage the kids to go up there. Because the first thing everybody at the table thought was, this was kind of a pity prize, that we didn't win anything else, and they didn't want the poor little high school kids to leave with, you know, no prize. Um, another thought did occur to me, but I wasn't quite sure until maybe after a few other awards, and that is that during the competition we had a leak, and we had to solve a problem, and there wasn't time to do any kind of major engineering adjustment on the robot. So through a series of discussions in a school van, uh, we came to the conclusion that tampons were the key to our, our problem. So we had a, a um, by default, because Lorenzo took the longest to say, not me, he, he, was, he was voted as being the person who had to go and get the tampons. And Lorenzo comes running out of the drugstore with a box of tampons like it was a trophy. <laughs> And so, of course, you know, being the scientists that we are, the first thing we want to know is, well, how many cc's does that each tampon hold? So we found a Dixie cup in the restroom, and we put it with water in there, and we just about three to four ounces of water, and we put the tampon in, and to our surprise, it went poof. So it was pretty instant. We also had six cameras on our robot, but we used and a creative way of uh, hooking up the video signal so we could see any one of the cameras at any one time, but, but with basically six cameras with one set of wires. So it made it more efficient for us. Um, so with a lot of little things like that, and all our wiring on the robot being internal in the frame, that was something that was stood out from everybody else. So we got the Design Elegance Award. Then came the technical writing. And we got first place in technical writing. And my first thought was, okay, 
They must have added up the points wrong. Because there's no way we could outright MIT in a technical paper. But we did. Um, and then they came to the overall presentation, where they take the cumulative score of all those areas, and whoever has the most points wins. So in the underwater portion, we were number three. Cape Fear Community College, which has an underwater engineering program, they were ranked number two, and MIT was number one underwater. So when they announced third place was Cape Fear Community College, okay, we thought, well, maybe we're fourth, you know, we'll see what happens, but we, that's what we're looking at. And then we heard <clears throat> MIT was number two. And so now we're thinking, and then who the heck is first? Man, never did it occur until I remembered that promise I made to Lorenzo. <laughs> and I thought, wow, it's not going to happen, but I better cover my bases. So I pulled him by the t-shirt and I said, under, if we win, under no circumstances do you run around start yelling hooters. <laughs> and it's a good thing I said that because we won. Um, he did turn around and mouth Hooter toward me. <laughs> he didn't say anything audibly, so I guess that was okay. The next thing that happened was, the years after that, students that would come to the program, what excuse could they give for not being successful? Could they use the fact that they're from you know, a Latino background? No. Can they use the fact that they don't have any money, or the school or program doesn't have enough to support them? Could it be that maybe other schools have better teachers or more resources? No. They had no excuses. So what happened was is they had to rise to the next challenge. Those four boys handed the baton in a relay race, and the next group of kids had to either drop the baton or pick it up and start running. So it became difficult for the kids to have excuses. And so the successes came. Um, I'll let this play and then we'll talk about it. There is no spoon. There is no spoon? Then you'll see that it is not the spoon that bends, it is only yourself. everything. 
Because it's only when they have all those different kinds of relationships that they grow into a fuller, more capable human being. And I think, since I'm off my script, I think that's it. So thank you very much for your time. kids, I've got credit recovery kids, and I have roughly 14 EDU 101 students every Saturday morning. Sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little less, because they're also committed to other things like JROTC. So I have these kids in here today, and I am working with Maria. Maria is probably one of the only sophomores in that room. When Maria started as a freshman, she had the great fortune of being told, you are in the lowest quartile of the entire school. <coughs> Maria was on a third grade level, which is not something people assume because we're Franklin. We have 100% pass rate on AIMS. This morning I tested Maria. She tested this morning at seventh grade. In one year, she's made four years growth. Now, the teacher part of me has to tell you the other part of the story, which is class is supposed to end at 12. At 1 o'clock, I told the kids, guys, I have kids of my own, and they need to go to their school fair, so you guys got to clear out. And I had to unfortunately break up the discussion in the back of the room where an EDU 101 tutor was working with a credit recovery tutor, but the joke was is the tutor was being tutored. <laughs> and the recovery kid was saying to him, no man, that's not, that's not checks and balances, that's separation of power. See, man, look at what it says right here in the Constitution. <laughs> but that's the beauty of it. I, feels so redundant there. He knows, I'll walk around campus, I'll check out other things, why? Because they can take care of each other. So if you did etymology earlier, I love etymology, I'm an English teacher at heart. So let me tell you what opportunity means. It means pushing towards a port or harbor. That's what opportunity means. See, we tell these kids, you can do it, you can do anything. But if we're not gonna show them how to do it, we're lying. And that's what opportunity means, is pushing them towards the harbor that we know that they are capable of doing. Thank you. I was watching television a few years back, and Jeremiah Wright came on TV, and he said something that really touched me. He said, African American and Hispanic students learn differently than white Caucasians, whereas white Caucasian students can uh, learn well independently from books and computers. African American and Hispanic students, some of them need the interaction, the one on one human interaction. So, does that mean we throw away all of our computers? Absolutely not. But what it means is we have opportunities for one on one instruction so that we can expand the capacity to learn independently from computers and from books. Does that make sense? Several months ago, Gene came to our sophomore English team and he talked to us about the peer tutoring program. Um, I gave it a try because that's what us teachers do. We try everything, we do everything we're told to do. We're soldiers. And um, it turned out to be one of the best experiences I've had so far. Um, not only did it save me time, um, before this, I, all I could do is wish to clone myself to be able to help each one of my 150 students one-on-one, -on -one, because those are the moments where I really feel like I'm getting through to the kids. Um, but I can't do that. So luckily, I, I have some of those 150 students that I trust enough um, and I see are bright enough and helpful enough and caring enough to work with those other kids and really make a difference and make an impact with them. Um, and so I've had those students come in and work with the other students and not only have I seen growth in their ability to read and write but I mean it's so wonderful to see them being decent human beings um, as Jean said um, they need to be able to ask for help when they need it and I see these kids doing this now asking the tutors to work with them and, and help them with their writing we get to reach so many more people that way so it's been a really great experience, and I just want to thank all of you for 
contributing to be able to fund this program because students really do learn better this way and we need the funds to um, help our students read better, write better, and just be, you know, decent human beings. So, thank you very much. What are we doing? We're creating a culture of citizenship. And the culture, we talk about getting somewhere, strategy, goal. But where are we coming from? What culture are we working in? And I guarantee you this, if we come from a culture of generosity, which causes uh, cooperation, which causes support, when we come from that culture, we're going to get so, more, so many more gains in, in, the, in the long run. Now, one of the things, you have a, a paper at your table. This is about a tax credit donation. Please take those home. We talked about what we can do. Well, let me put it this way. If you make a tax credit donation to the Phoenix Union High School District, you can direct it to peer tutoring. If one person makes one $400 donation, that's 40 hours of peer tutoring. If one person has four friends, I'm terrible at math here, so that, that's 400. So, we have like uh, 2,000, uh, and then we have the Cardinals, they're talking about matching this, that's 4,000. We're talking 400 hours of peer tutoring one person can cost. Would that make a difference? Yeah. I'm just so thankful. I just don't, I can't bring into words how a man can actually see value in a young 19 year old boy and to tell me that I can learn. And it's not just about football, it's about education. Me and Gene Fazio became one when he introduced me to the other side of Toby Wright. He was the one that actually told me I wasn't the dummy, I wasn't the stupid one. My comprehension learning can happen if you work on it and trust me. Putting together words in comprehension form could never happen. So what I did was I became a recluse. I became insecure. And I hid behind football. But when Gene Basil figured out that I could not read on a college level, let alone high school form, I just remember him telling me after class, I need to see you after class. And I came in with these aspirations on this uh, freshman All-American, and I got this pedigree name. But for some reason, you can't read. So I laughed and giggled at him and said, hey, I can read. I just can't comprehend what, I, what, what I'm reading. He said, first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make you trust me. I'm going to make you trust me because I am never going to leave you if you stay with me. And then he says, I'm going to give you instructions. Because in your life, I'm sure, right now, you have discipline problems. I need you to show up at this time. I need you to be available at this time. I need you to trust me all the time. And I need you to understand what the term win means. So I look at him and I say, when? What do you mean when? He goes, no. W-I-N. I said, okay, I can read that, I understand. He goes, no. The W stands for what's. The I stands for important. The N stands for now. For a young kid, it wasn't a super califragilist equation. It was small to the point, and it gave me hope. So for every time I turned up, I kept telling myself what's important now. And all facets of my life, 
That was a part of my belief. That was indoctrinated into my savvy, into my spirit. And they were simple words. My journey with Mr. Fazio has said, whatever he says, I do. At my place of business, he walks in, there's things going on. Oh my God, here comes Mr. Fazio. Hey, told me I got this, I got that. Even if I don't want to do it, I have to. Because my debt ratio to him is too big. I wanted to coach, I wanted to teach, and I asked my boss if he would get a copy of my credentials from our college. And the college was Lutheran College, small Lutheran College. And he read my credentials. This was something I couldn't get on my own. And it said, I am glad that Rufus has decided to teach in the inner city schools of Chicago, because I doubt if he would ever make it in this highly competitive business world. That was 40 years ago. That summer, that night, I went home and Debbie and I chatted a little bit and I said, this man has no idea who I am. And he was my advisor for four years. Four years. Small college, 2,100 students, about 50 African Americans. He was Caucasian. And what he did was to profile me. What he did was I thought he was lifting me and he was not lifting me. So I will tell you, for easy 20 years, I was driven by anger. I was driven by anger to prove him wrong. I was driven by anger to say that an inner city young man, a, a, one, a gentleman who was also a jock as well, can be what he wants to be if you help to build that vision. During the recession, our high point was 275,000 students. When House Bill 2008 came out and Senate Bill 1070, we had to increase our tuition for undocumented students. We lost 12,000 undocumented students in one semester. 12,000. What they needed was a waiver. That waiver was on the list and the students didn't have it. President Obama came up with the Deferred Action Waiver and that number was on the list. I didn't ask my board's permission. I didn't ask anybody else's permission and I told our colleges that you will now accept any student that walks in with that waiver. Only 1,200 of those 12,000 students have come back. And now, our governor at the time decided that I was doing the wrong thing. So we have been in court for the last year and a half because I am supposedly the individual who is violating the state law. But I will tell you, when you live in a community, when you know that there are individuals that can build a community, that a state and a community that is becoming majority minority, and when we think about ways for us to give back, <coughs> I talk to Gene frequently because I want to make a difference in the role that I have. We can demonstrate that if you reach down early enough and if you're willing to take a chance, if you're willing to dream, if you're willing to be innovative, that you can make a change that no one else can take away from you. And I too, tell me when Gene calls, I respond. Uh, so I'm here to just tell you that as long as I am with the Maricopa Community Colleges, there will be an opportunity for us to give back to our communities. There will be partnerships that will be unprecedented. There will be pathways from our colleges to the universities that start in the public school system, that are nurtured, new partnerships that say our students can be doctors and lawyers and engineers. And I will tell you, and I'll close with this, we have just received a major $13.4 million trade adjustment grant from President Obama uh, funding. We are working with individuals who are working for APS and SRP that are line workers because they needed a job. But we are telling them that with these stackable credentials, they can come in and out of our colleges. They can begin at a high school 
and then coming in and out of our colleges, and within eight steps, they can have an engineering degree. And I am committed. Maricopa Community Colleges are committed, and I am making believers of our board as well. So I ask you to join us tonight, bring in some other believers as well, and you can believe that this partnership will continue. And as long as Gene has energy, I'm sure all of us will have energy as well. Thank you. <laughs>